Alexandra Harrison from Dewey Renewable Energy spoke to the Thrive community about decarbonizing mining and steel manufacture and how large industries are meeting the challenge of sustainability in a presentation entitled Decarbonizing Mining and Steel. Alexandra's talk was part of our SDG 7 Energy, Science and Technology theme for the month. After the session, Alex kindly took questions from the audience. Um, Morris? Yeah, all good. Uh, actually, I was muted before, sorry. Uh, very nice presentation, Alexandra. Uh, that was very informative. I mean, I also didn't know about so much about uh, Australian sustainable technologies. I mean, um, we are in an era where uh, we pledge for all the climate change and then green sustainable technologies. I think decarbonization is one of the trending topics topic these days. Um, We'll just move on to a Q&A session. I'll start off with uh, one of mine. Um, so um, I was thinking, so you mentioned about the COP26, which was recently held uh, at uh, UK. So is there any specific um, aspect that they have done to uh, for decarbonization and for the green steel manufacturing in terms of that? That's a, that's a really good question, Binyota. Um In terms of the commitments that were made um, and the, the signatories uh, during COP26, what I have been able to read and gather has been that uh, commitments were very broad. It wasn't, um, there weren't specific commitments relating to uh, green metal manufacturing. Yeah, and um, one person asks, uh, any alternatives to steel as a construction material? I'm, I'm going to say yes. Uh, we can all think of wood as um, yeah as medium. Um, there's also uh, the the use of recyclable concrete that has been recent however those aren't actually my area of expertise so i can only mention those in terms of their names because it's just what i have read in recently but that's that i highly recommend going um, and doing further uh reading up on it climate works has a lot and i do believe um correct me if i'm wrong morris but i thought i saw a blog post on Thrive's website that um, did mention something about construction? Yes, we actually have written about um, uh, concrete, uh, cement, uh, which obviously is probably the number one uh, use of uh, water and other resources in the construction industry. And we've also talked about uh, some of the alternatives for fossil fuel base energy um, that's used in the construction. Uh, if I could just ask you to stop your slides, by the way, so we can actually see the people in, in the room and uh, I'll pass it back over to Binada with um, uh, some more questions. Uh, if not, I have a question of my own as well. Yeah, uh, questions are coming through really fast. <laughs> Actually, uh, David has asked, um, where does Australia stand in relation to the rest of the world on green steel research and development? Um, so last week's reports indicated that Australia is leading the R&D. We can thank Twiggy and the wonderful work that Fortescue Metals is doing in that space. Uh, in terms of um, commercial uh, commercial level manufacturing, the, the industry has quite an extensive amount uh, to go. The largest... Um, the largest size of green steel manufacturing currently is one kilo at a time. So 
uh, when we're talking about tons daily, and um, one kilo just isn't going to cut it. <laughs> so we do have quite a quite a way to go. Yeah. And uh, Jeff has asked, what is the volume of two tons of carbon dioxide uh, in, uh, as in, in volumes, if you can explain? That is a, that is a good question um, because- Probably uh, a lot. <laughs> it is, it's definitely a lot. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know to answer that one right off um, the top of my head. Um, but that is one that I think uh, if other people know the answer to that, I'm really keen to know what it is. Um, and uh, Rolf uh, is asking, um, was the three corporates given in any incentive to go carbon neutral? Like, are there any aids for us, uh, like motivating people to go carbon neutral? So um, if we're talking about um, like government kickbacks. Yeah, or, probably. Yeah. Um, so for large scale users, there, there are things called um, large scale green certificates that were part of um, the Australian government's renewable energy target scheme. Mm -hmm. um, they are being phased out uh, as of 2025. They were committed over 10 years ago, but with no change to the legislation in Australian government. Um, those, there's not really that at, the, at present, the Australian government doesn't give incentives to pursue this. However, as I said at the start, the, there is a lot of um, drive from industry because Industry is aware and consumers are, um, are voting with their feet in terms of they are demanding that, um, that their banking industries who uh, buy shares in these large organisations actually are doing something that is um, ethical to the future benefit of the planet. Um, that in and of itself is a, an excellent motivator and if that is what is uh, causing industry to, to act, to step up, then um, that is in turn going to cause, uh, going to give the government, the Australian federal government, the push it needs to legislate. Yeah, that's true. Um, so uh, Bruce has asked a quite long question. Uh, let me just read out for you. Uh, the hydrogen mentioned in using to create steel and strip the oxygen and the byproduct being water, is the hydrogen used? Is it hydrogen gas or are you looking at fusion in order to produce the energy to dioxide the steel? So that, that's a brilliant question because it's um, an area I'm reading up more on. Was it Ruth who asked the question, Vignota? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bruce. Bruce. So, Bruce, yeah. that's that's a great question because it is um, it has recently um, encouraged me to follow the path of um, reading and uh, researching about um, hydrogen development. So, currently, um, there is a lot of uh, financial incentive in uh, in the Australian um, sorry in Western Australia. The state government uh, has committed quite an extensive amount to encourage. Um, industry to go and seek um, ways of developing renewable hydrogen power um, as a an exportable resource from Australia to the rest of the world. Um, that being said, uh, my areas of expertise are wind, and just recently I have developed more in terms of my knowledge base of uh, wind and um, and battery storage. So. I'd like to have been able to give you better information on what's happening there. I do know that um, the generation, it, it's definitely a containable um, resource that is exportable. So I, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't answer better than that, but I hope <laughs> a little bit of a direction. And it also, I, I do strongly encourage that, um, that we uh, continue to uh, firstly, Follow the anything on um, on the socials. 
relating to hydrogen. Hydrogen will explode um, fairly quickly in the coming uh, years because it is some, it, it's going to be able to give us that fast and um, high intensity power that um, hard to abate industries require. And uh, one more question uh, from Bruce, uh, the same. So he has asked the thermal energy for one site uh, that use 40% of this thermal energy, is it using hot rocks to generate the electricity needed for the uh, green steel manufacturing? Uh, was that for Agnew? Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, so uh, the example I gave about Agnew Gold, um, the Agnew Gold Mine, uh, in that instance, uh, EDL is using gas to supplement and to maintain a, um, the stable of power uh, in the eventuality of... So obvious, uh, for those who are not familiar with, um, with wind, um, wind generators um, consist of turbines that are connected together and go to substation. Um, if the wind is too low, the wind turbines don't move. If the wind exceeds um, and is too high, they have to; those turbines have to be turned off. So we need the the reason we have wind and solar together is that they create they they level off of the energy generation. Um, and generally speaking, night times you're going to have a much more consistent wind. Um, that will be able to generate and during the day you're going to have um, your your power profile for your um, for your power station is going to be um, planned out so that it accounts for lower sun during the winter and much higher and much longer sun days during the summer months so um, yeah I hope that helps to, to sort of explain uh, the why we use why we some at, at present still are reliant on some fossil fuel and generally speaking we have the thermal gas as our backup yeah um and a suggestion coming through for uh, regarding the incentives for the government like carbon credits mm -hmm. some yeah so someone has suggested that and um Question from Chaturanga, he says, would you say that in some ways there are dangers we overlook when it comes to renewable energy? Uh, I'm asking this because of the prevalence of electric cars. To my knowledge, electric powertrains um, makes cars much heavier than gasoline counterparts. So electric batteries are also far more likely to overheat and ignite. And if I'm not mistaken, would produce more dangerous wastage as well. I can see the concerns there. Um, yeah. He's it is basically asking about the dangers we overlook yeah. when it comes to the renewable energy. Yeah. Um, there, I think one of the dangers that has been um, raised is in regards to waste. And I think uh, that question and the comment did touch on that. Um, yes, in terms, it did start off with... Um, the um, the EVs, electric vehicles, and the uh, the dangers there. Now, I can't speak to how the um, electric vehicles uh, operate. Uh, I do believe, and I do see it. Um, the Australian government um, is committing, uh, has committed already um, to an increase in its funding uh, and uh, through Arena, which is um, they are a government body that supports and encourages investor confidence into uh, renewable spaces. Uh, and we should be expecting that, especially on the eastern seaboard of Australia, we are seeing a very fast growth in EV um, availability for things like um, stations, for fast charge stations. Uh, there's a lot of other communication that is happening in the electric vehicle space that I don't have the subject matter expertise to speak to. 
Uh, when it comes to waste and dangers relating to uh, renewable energy, a lot of it comes back to environmental and waste. Uh, what uh, the, the German government has put in place in the last 12 months is an excellent example of how to manage the waste of um, photovoltaic uh, solar panels. In the next 10 years, we should expect that we're going to have a huge influx in waste coming out of these photovoltaic panels that are coming off rooftops, that are coming off um, the end of life solar farms, large scale solar farms. Because of that, we need to think of firstly, how are these, uh, what is the, the decomposition of the aggregate parts going to look like? Um, in Australia alone, there in the last um, 12 months, there has been a, um, a significant increase from approximately two organisations that have been taking and uh, so they, they publish themselves as um, recyclers of photovoltaic panels. Um, but what we're seeing now is a huge increase in that market space because of the influx that we're going to have coming through of those um, end of the lifetime. Um, in terms of reusable materials in these um, and precious materials, that's going to be something that is going to be of great interest. So, yeah, um, yeah it's the dumping that obviously has a lot of people concerned. Yeah, probably we can uh, refer to it as e-waste. Yes, yeah. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, uh, based on the thermal energy, uh, there's one more question. Um, uh, Christina says, uh, uh, to technically speaking, to be able to procure or acquire an appropriate location to make use of thermal energy, it would require a higher, highly geological active location, such as that of areas near volcanoes. So with this, how does Australia plan to uh, use this concept with consideration to uh, logical issues like uh, natural disasters? Uh, any, any, any comments on that? I think that's a topic I'm going to um, encourage discussion uh, offline. Uh, that's, yeah. yeah, it's, so, it's such, a, such an amazing topic. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have the expertise and that really deserves a lot of um, time and space um, yeah. and air time. I think we have to discuss that probably in depth yeah. rather than as one question. Yeah. Um, so, um, questions coming through. Um, uh, there's another part of it. So, how can the rest of the world with high potential for thermal energy utilization integrate the use of thermal energy in financially stable manner? Um, that is like in Hawaii and Philippines. Can I get and, you to repeat that one? Yeah. So, um, also... Uh, it's with regard to the, uh, for the previous one I asked, uh, how can the rest of the world with high potential for thermal energy utilization integrate the use of thermal energy in a financially stable manner? My knowledge of thermal energy is uh, it's about 10, 15 years old. And I know that um, that space has significantly increased. So I know that uh, when I first looked into this in Australia, the, um, the amount of water required for, um, for R&D purposes alone was uh, quite extensive and it was a bit not, very, um, not very well received. Um, that being said, we can now look across um, the Bass Strait and, and we look at what New Zealand is doing and they're doing an amazing job in that space. So um, I wish I could speak more to that point, yeah, but I, I do good. recommend reading more up on that. Um, I, yes, Hawaii is an excellent example. Um, New Zealand also is brilliant and, and they're just, they're very close. Yeah. So... Um... One question from uh, Sinwal. He asks, do we have enough capacity to power the steel manufacturing plants with uh, green energy? 
uh, how long will it take to have the most plants running on green electricity um, based on uh, the feasibility of green energy, I think? Yeah, so first things we have to do um, is we have to electrify the processes. At the moment, the processes are fire driven, so they're heat driven, but those that heat comes from burning from fossil fuels um, because they, they provide a clean heat source and a, a fast heat source and a controllable heat source. Um, so we need to electrify that process in order to make it an abatable industry. And mainly uh, when I say that, I mean make it a, 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 an easier to um, generate, uh, to run using green power uh, sources. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to start with step one there. Yeah. Like green power sources. How do, yeah. how do we electrify those processes? And then once we have determined that, then how much electricity is required? And then once we've determined that, how much additional power do we need to generate from uh, green uh, from renewable sources that will uh, provide our electrified current um, lifestyles, as well as supplementing and replacing the um, the required power generation for steel manufacturing. Yeah. Um, so to wrap up the Q and A session, uh, the final one. <laughs> so it's the. Uh, Raman asks, the clean coal technology, uh, which removes 90% of carbon dioxide, utilized anywhere in Australia for mining and steel manufacturing. Is it currently being used or? The green coal? Uh, clean coal technology. Clean. So I have not read much up on this. Um, and the reason that I haven't is um, because clean coal is still coal. Um, and while we're using coal, it's not zero emissions. Mm. So um, I would have to um, defer to someone who was more informed on that one, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, more questions, but uh, we'll take those questions uh, to be answered offline. And if time permits, and if uh, there's more interest in uh, this topic, we will just uh, have our speaker again. And over to you, Maurice. Thanks for the nice discussion, Alexandra. Thanks for that, um, Binoda. Uh, yeah, I, I did have a question also and, and a comment. Um, my question first was actually about uh, nuclear. No one seemed to have mentioned here. I know there's advances in nuclear fusion. Uh, as well, uh, but it's very experimental. Uh, I'd be interested on your take, not necessarily from a technical standpoint, but just uh, overall in terms of uh, uh, bringing in a nuclear fission. Obviously, it is a clean source, but there are some uh, byproducts which may be seen as toxic and harmful. So what's your take on, on this or, or from a uh, environmental perspective and from your company's perspective? What's their take on on nuclear fission and are they actually doing any work in that area? So UV is not doing any work in that space. Um, they're primarily using uh, those three um, industries that are power system that I was referring to before, which is the, the wind, the solar and the battery storage. Um, in terms of nuclear, uh, I also find that uh, most interesting. Uh, I have I've been reading quite a bit on uh, what the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been doing in terms of the R&D in that space. Uh, they have, um, unfortunately, with um, due to political and you know, 